All right, so let's start again. Good evening. I'm David Assad, the Chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals for the City of Fall River. It's 6 p.m. on Thursday, June 25, 2020. We are meeting at one government center in the atrium. This meeting is being conducted pursuant to Governor Baker's order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20, dated March 12, 2020, at 8.40 p.m. Pursuant to Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20, Subsection F, I hereby notify all persons in attendance that this meeting is being recorded with both video and audio devices. Our recording secretary this evening is Brittany Farrier, the lady to my left. Uh, she's recording an audio version in Fall River Government TV. Alex Mello uh, is recording both a video and audio version. If anyone desires to make an audio, video, or combination recording thereof, please notify me now and I shall make a public announcement of your intention. Present this evening, albeit remotely, are permanent members Jim Calkins, Attorney Carolyn Morissette, Vice Chair, alternate, not, not alternate, permanent member Dan Dupere, the gentleman to my right, alternate member Joe Pereira. William Kenny is the Director of Planning and he's the gentleman sitting to my immediate left. Brittany, have all petitions to be considered been properly advertised and all interested parties notified in accordance with the rules and regulations of the Zoning Board of Appeals and Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40A as amended? Yes. I declare the June 25, 2020 scheduled meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals of the City of Fall River open for such business as shall regularly come before it. I remind all persons presenting before the board, including the petitioners, abutters, anyone in support or anyone opposed to the petition, that your presentation should be limited to three minutes. Questions and responses must be directed through the chairman. The board's rules and regulations direct the board to specifically look for information which supports the petitioner's claim. As such, the petitioner should identify and factually support the basis for the petition. I hereby advise the petitioners and all interested persons that this board is the zoning board of appeals. This board's authority exists pursuant to Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40A and is limited in scope and deals with the use of land as regulated by Chapter 86 of the Ordinances of the City of Fall River. Additional permits, licenses, reviews, and or approvals may be required for the specific development and or use which is the subject of the petition before the Zoning Board this evening. The clerks in the building, planning, engineering, and licensing departments are competent in the discharge of their duties as clerks. They are, however, not lawyers and are not competent to give legal advice. The action taken by this board has a real and lasting effect upon the title to your real estate. I urge all petitioners to seek competent legal counsel before filing your petitions and after a decision of the board has been made. For example, there is a city ordinance 2015-11, section 10-1, requiring site plan reviews. A copy of the ordinance is available at the city clerk's office or from the planning department. I remind everyone that the building inspector is the zoning enforcement authority, and you're here this evening because the building inspector has determined that your proposed action is contrary to the city of Fall River's zoning ordinances. The city charter, section 9-18, mandates that all multiple member bodies develop and adopt rules or policy for public comment. We have adopted such a policy, which in short provides for citizen input on zoning board specific matters at the end of this meeting. I disclose that an official copy of the Fall River Zoning Ordinance is available at the city clerk's office. One cannot rely on the online zoning ordinance. I also disclose that the new recodified edition approved by the Planning Board and City Council in accordance with Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40A, Section 5, now with its yellow cover, is the official copy with the last ordinance in there, 2019-23, incorporated therein. Are there any questions before we begin? Is that John Frank? Yes. yes John. Okay, hello, John Frank has now joined us remotely. Uh, so we'll start with agenda item number one. Uh, New England Power, I think, NE Power Company, DBA National Grid, care of Joshua Lee Smith, Esquire, 
181 Bell Rock Road, lot W-1-6. It's a variance request for construction and installation of substation related equipment and facilities. 43 feet by 66 feet, control house waving minimal, minimum front yard setback in the WR water resource and watershed um, and water supply district lot size 2.7 plus or minus acres. Good evening, sir. You identify yourself for the record, please, and tell us what you'd like to do. Good, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, before me, as well as in virtual Zoom land, uh, for the record, my name is Joshua Lee Smith. I am, I am an attorney with the law firm of Bada and Dewey, uh, here this evening representing New England Power Company doing business as National Grid in connection with its proposed uh, project, which is essentially an upgrading of an existing uh, unmanned electric substation located off of Bell Rock Road. Um, I promise to be brief. Uh, I think you had mentioned under three minutes is going to be the goal here. So, and I know that the board has a robust agenda. I'm going to remain seated, uh, given that I, I'm assuming I shouldn't be touching this microphone. I do have uh, with me here a depiction of one of the drawings that had been submitted uh, as part of our application. Uh, I also want to introduce Dan McIntyre, who is the substation engineer with respect to this project. Um, very briefly, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the site itself and then go right into the project and give some uh, arguments with respect to the variants uh, that we are requesting. Uh, the site itself, as you had mentioned, Mr. Chair, is approximately 2.75 acres in size. Um, this is a relatively small portion of a much larger tract of land, about 8,500 acres of land, conservation land. Uh, so needless to say, this site is a very remote, uh, in, in a very remote part of the city. Um, there are no residences, no businesses uh, anywhere in close proximity to this property. Uh, the substation itself has been in operation since the early 1960s when it was first energized. What the company is looking to do is to upgrade uh, much of its existing equipment and facilities, uh, standard substation related equipment such as transformers and circuit breakers, uh, switches, et cetera, as well as our underlying, sorry. No, as, please go ahead. As well as their underlying support structures. Uh, the, the actual relief that the company is seeking is specifically with respect to uh, the control building which is depicted here, if you can see it, in green. That is the one building that is being proposed to be constructed as part of this upgrade project. Uh, there is also, uh, as part of the project, uh, proposed a, a paved driveway that will lead to the control building. As Mr. Chair, uh, you had mentioned the building will be approximately 2,800 square feet in size. And uh, the relief that we are seeking is with respect to the minimum front yard setback. Uh, which under the Fall River Zoning Ordinance is 75 feet for properties that are located in this particular zoning district. The control house itself is going to be, is proposed to be located 47 feet from Bell Rock Road. Uh, and so therefore we are seeking, the company is seeking a 28 foot variance uh, from the minimum 75 foot front yard setback requirement. Uh, the, the site itself, in terms of the, the variance and the standards uh, that, that need to be met, uh, I guess I will underscore the fact that in terms of the uniqueness of the site, the, the shape and, and size of the lot itself uh, is relatively small with respect to the equipment that is located and to be located within the substation itself. Although not specifically depicted on this particular drawing, there is in fact uh, a lot of equipment that is not shown here. It had to be redacted from this plan because due to security reasons. Um, however, the site is uh, and But they and exist is, already. I'm sorry? They exist on the site already. They exist on the site already, some of which, uh, some of that equipment will be removed and replaced as part of the upgrades for the project. Uh, the so, only component yes. that you need a variance for is only for the front, re front offset, front yard requirement, is that correct? Front yard setback with respect to only the building. That's the, that, I mean, that's the only component that you need relief from this board for. That's correct. All your other activities are in conformity 
with the zoning district? They are either in conformity or, as confirmed by Glenn Hathaway, the building inspector and the zoning enforcement officer, uh, he interpreted that the other facilities, which are equipment, transmission, uh, transformers, and, and other substation-related equipment, that those items are not subject to uh, minimum yard setbacks. Uses to it. Okay. So the focus is on the building, which again is in this green area here. There is limited area on within this 2.75 acre uh, uh, perimeter of the substation footprint. Um, even with the existing footprint today, the company as part of the project is looking to expand approximately 20,000 20, square feet in a northerly direction to accommodate this new building. Otherwise, there, there's no room uh, to put this building anywhere else on the site. The other constraint that this particular property has is with respect to the environmental constraints. This is the entire area, as I mentioned, is conservation land. Um, it's, it's part of the city's bioreserve area. And there are wetlands in close proximity to where this building is going to be located, as well as the substation itself. I'll, I'll, I want to point out that the company did seek and receive and obtain an order of conditions with respect to the wetlands and this project. You, Mr. Chair, you had mentioned before uh, site plan review. We did meet with the, or we submitted our application to the site plan review committee. Uh, that was unanimously approved. Um, and so as far as the company is concerned, the uh, environmental sensitivity with respect to the wetlands and, and other uh, environmental aspects of the surrounding uh, areas around the substation have been vetted uh, and and approved by other agencies of the city. Um, so we're limited, we're constrained with respect to the size of the substation footprint itself. Uh, and also, I will point out that the, there is a very unique regulations and guidelines and standards that the company has to uh, uh, maintain with respect to these types of facilities. Uh, mandated by not only internal company policy, but also the National Electric Safety Code, as well as FERC and ISO New England, which require minimum minimum distances uh, with respect to um, distances between equipment and buildings, as well as equipment from property lines. So with all of that being said, uh, there's, there's really no other area where this building could be. We also tried to minimize the length of the proposed new driveway um, leading from com or coming off from Bell Rock Road. Uh, and if the building were, for example, to be located farther to the rear, there would have been more uh, impacts with respect to the uh, environmental, um, sen environmentally sensitive areas such as the wetlands. And there would have to have been an extension of the driveway, which means more uh, impacts on open space. So with all of that, uh, I suppose I'll, I'll leave it op open to any questions that the board may have or the general public. Conservation and site plan review didn't object to the paved driveway with a impervious uh, surface? That's correct. OK. Uh, members of the board, any questions? Dan? Carolyn? No. Jim? No. John? OK. Is there anyone here in favor of this petition? Is there anyone here opposed to this petition? Mr. Director of Planning, do you have any comments on this? Uh, no, I don't think. Okay. So that's the petition. It's a singular waiver of the front yard setback. Uh, motion to grant, motion to deny. Move to grant. Motion to grant by Jim Calkins. Do I have a second? No second. Second by Dan Dupere. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Jim Calkins? Yes. Uh, John Frank, you got your hand up to vote yes or to ask a question? Affirmative. Yes? He doesn't oh, have a volume. You don't have volume. You can't hear? Okay. He can hear. He, he can hear. He can't talk. Hear, but you can't talk. It's a thumbs up from you. All right. John Frank says yes. There Dan Dupier says There's yes. <laughs> Carolyn Morissette? Yes. You already said yes. Chairman Assad, yes. The petition is granted. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you very much. I don't know. Is it, well, John, if you can hear me, is it something uh, mechanical or is it physical? Did you inhale bleach and ammonia? <laughs> is, um, okay. It's indicating, it, it's indicating that is, uh, John, your, your mic is muted. Oh. Thank you. All right. Well, the next one's going to be at 625. Does Alex need to unmute oh. him or I don't know. Alex. 
Is there any, is there something up with, oh, now I got two John Franks. I think it's on your end. Oh, it's on your end, John. I was having the same problem with my, uh, my Oh, you were? Yo, how's that? That's good. Did okay, you? I was having some technical difficulties. I apologize for getting on late. Uh, my laptop wasn't working and my phone, I was switching back and forth, but I should be good now. Thank and, you. And you're the computer expert. <laughs> is, it six, is it 625 yeah. yet? 625. 625. Okay, we're live and in color again. Highland Farms Development Care of Peter Salino Esquire, 20 Steep Brook Terrace, Lot 2, Highland Farms. Lot U158, it's a variance request to allow existing deck to remain, waiving side yard setback requirements in the S district. Lot size 34,500 plus or minus square feet. Good evening, Attorney Salino. Will you identify yourself for the record? Certainly. Good evening for purposes of the record. My name is Peter Salino. I practice law at 550 Locust Street here in Fall River. Uh, before you tonight on my petition is Highland Farms Development. For those of you who are unfamiliar with that name, this is the site located to the north of St. Vincent's home where the new homes are being constructed. My client is the developer. Uh, lot 20, or I'm sorry, 20 Steep Brook Terrace, uh, the home is constructed, the deck is on the ground, the footings are in, and through error and inadvertence, the deck is 12 feet from the sideline to the north, as opposed to the required um, 15 feet. So we're off by three feet. There are really two ways in my mind to solve the problem. The first is to seek a partial release from the mortgage holder on the lot to the north, which is labeled 25 Steep Brook. Unfortunately, that mortgage has been sold on the secondary market, and I feared that pursuing a partial release was probably something like a year uh, endeavor. So as a consequence, pre-COVID, on March 11th, we filed this application uh, to be heard in front of this board, seeking a variance to allow the existing deck to stay where it is, albeit three feet shy of the required minimum setback. So in essence, we're before you here because of a mistake, we admit the mistake and we ask that it be permitted to stay given that it is somewhat de minimis. It's consistent with the neighborhood. It's not detrimental in any way. Um, it's just one of these things that happened. So someone didn't calibrate the transit or measure properly. Got it. It's a measuring error, yes. Okay. Uh, yes, and I will attest that trying to get the partial release in the plant. Are you okay, whoever that is? Okay. Um, all right. I have no questions. Members of the board, Dan, any questions? No. Jim Calkins? Uh, there is an existing house to the north of it then, because when I drove by, I couldn't even see the deck. There is, Mr. Calkins, an existing home to the north that has been sold. That's correct. It's so that answer, so it's sold, it's still not in the developer's The developer title. no longer possesses No longer owns right. it, okay. Um, who's that? Carolyn, any questions? No. Uh, John Frank, any questions? No. Uh, is there anyone here in favor of this petition? Is there anyone here opposed to this petition? The chairman. Well, I hear somebody. Patrick. Patrick Higgins, yes. Once again, this is another one of those uh, Request for a variance, even though yeah, it's a three, it's a three foot setback, three three feet wrong, but it doesn't comply with the law. As this, in, uh, the way I'm reading this uh, agenda item, it says to allow the existing deck. So I'm, I'm assuming that the deck is already up and in, and uh, yeah, the petition was filed back in March. But when was the deck put up? Because um, I'm I'm opposed to any variance to anything that. You know, we get asked for forgiveness instead of getting permission type thing. And yeah, it's only three feet, but it's three feet not compliance with the law. So I'm opposed to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Can you want to respond Just, to that? I'll thing? respond briefly, which is to be distinguished from the petition that occurred on a Tuesday night with the carport. This is a fully permitted subdivision. The city's highly involved. This was not a clandestine Sunday afternoon construction, pure accident. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Um, all right, so we've got the petition. It's a variance under 40A, Section 10. Um, do we have um, a motion to grant, a motion to deny? I'll make a motion to grant. Motion to grant by Dan Dupere. Do I have a second? I'll second. 
Is that Jim Calkins? You'd second it? So did Carolina. So. <laughs> well, I think you came in together. I heard you first. So Jim Calkins okay. second. Any discussion on the motion? Okay. All those in favor? Dan Dupier? Yes. John Frank? Jim Calkins? Yes. Yes. Carolyn Morissette? Yes. Yes. And Chairman Assad? Yes. Thank you, Attorney Salino. That petition's been granted. Thank you very much. Thank you, members of the board. Next petition will be heard at 645. Six forty five right now. So we're back live. Uh, Six forty five, Kevin Machado, eight eighty two, nine hundred, Indian Town Road, lot W dash twenty three dash seven. It's a variance request to subdivide the existing two hundred eighty nine thousand five hundred and thirty plus or minus square foot lot into two, leaving an existing single family dwelling at uh, nine hundred on lot number one. 8,000 plus or minus square feet, while raising an existing single family mobile home at number 882 and construct a single family home addition uh, to the existing garage, lot two, 209,000 plus or minus square feet, waiving requirements in the R80 district. We should also note that this is also in the um, Watershed and Water Supply Protection District Regulation Overlay. That's correct. Okay. Good. Will you identify yourself for the record and tell us what you'd like to Good do? Good evening. My name is Dan Aguiar. I'm a Senior Project Manager at SciTech Engineering with offices here in the city as well as Dartmouth and Marshfield. As the Chairman stated, uh, here this evening on behalf of Kevin Machado, who is the owner of the real estate at 882 and 900 Indian Town Road. Um, this parcel of land as it, consi as it sits currently uh, was created via a variance in 1990. It was previously combined with the lot that is directly in front of it, W23-6, which is number 880. Um, at that time, the two lots were separated, and just about immediately after that, the Machados purchased the piece of land. Since that time, there has been um, an elderly woman that lives, that they rent the single family home to, and they've been living in this mobile home uh, since they purchased the property about 31 years ago. And if you look in the petitions that I, that I submitted, there are actually photos in the assessor's records that show you um, both of the structures, actually all three of the structures. So there is the existing single family home that was constructed uh, in 1940, that's number 900. And there was the mobile home that was constructed around 1960. And then there was a 1,300 square foot garage structure that had been subsequently constructed in 2005. So currently we have three structures on this 289,000 square foot lot. Zoning for the area does require 80,000 square feet per lot and 300 feet of frontage. Building setbacks are 75 feet to the front, 50 to the side, and 75 to the rear. So the Machados had come to me, they were at a point where they had um, either to reconstruct or replace the existing trailer that they've been living in. It's the same trailer that they've been there for 31 years. Um, or they asked, could we potentially build a single family house on the lot? I said, well, I said, there's a couple of different avenues and different ways that you can go about it. I said, but right now you've got the two or three structures on the lot, the lot was created via variance. So anything that we do on the lot needs a new variance. There are no special permits or expansions. It was granted and created by, by a variance, so we need to continue forward with that same type of permit school. Conforming, yes, we are replacing the existing trailer. So it's like for like. It's a single family home.
being replaced with another single family home. I said, but I said, why don't we try and remove one of the non-conformities, which would be the multiple structures on this very large lot. So what we were able to do is to put together this plan that leaves the single family home on a lot conforming to the area and building setbacks, and that we would be constructing a new dwelling as an addition to the garage. Now the new dwelling, the structure itself, not the garage, the structure itself would meet all of the building setbacks, side yards, front yard, so that, that would not be an issue. And where we have a lot that currently is non-conforming to frontage with a total of 72 feet, really the only non-conformity that we're proposing is additional frontage waiver. So it's already non-conforming for frontage. We're asking it both lots to now be both not, uh, not meeting the requirements for frontage. So the new lot would be 209,000 square feet and the existing lot with, with the house on it would be 80,000 square feet. So areas we have no issue with. Really the only relief that we we're seeking is with regards to frontage. Again, a currently non-conforming through a variance, but we would be cutting that equally in half to 36 feet. What this would do is that it would get this 31-year-old mo motorhome off of the property, which would be an aesthetic improvement to the neighborhood. Um, and what it's also going to do, even more importantly, it's going to get an existing septic system, which is most likely failed because it was constructed many, many years ago um, and is probably contaminating groundwater to some extent. It will also require that this home, and this can be conditioned through the board, and the Board of Health is going to end up requiring it as well because the number of bedrooms will have a brand new Title V compliant septic system, which would be a drastic improvement for sewerage for the single family home motor home uh, that's currently in this water resource district or abutting the water resource um, district and but it's in the wastewater development overlay as well so overall it's a dramatic improvement for the neighborhood and the environment uh, it would allow them to remain on the property it's going to allow the um, the woman who currently rents the property for 41 years in the existing home to stay and um, we'll be able to construct a new home and get rid of the trailer. So when we, re with regards to hardship and, and things of that nature, the lot that we have was created through a variance and there were multiple structures, were multiple structures on that property then and now. So it's, it, it's a very unique situation. And yes, this shape of this lot was created through this variance. However, at that time, it was also dealing with multiple structures you added another multiple structure, so the home out in front was an additional one that was out there as well. So really the only relief we're seeking is that frontage requirement. Um, we've made sure that all the other building setbacks, other than they, how they exist now, uh, would be no more non-conforming than, than currently what's out there now. That's all. There is a theory in uh, land use and zoning that when you have situations like this, you wait for those particular pre-existing non-conforming uses to end and not recreate them or bring them back. Um, you've got this very sensitive area when you go to the watershed uh, and water supply protection district and read the purpose and what they're doing there, they really seem to be not encouraging further development or recreating um, what's out there. One of the other issues that I see uh, is and I found it, I couldn't figure out why, but they've got everything classified as two families. Well, what happens is because there are multiple dwelling units on the property. So if you read through the assessor's record where it's classified as two family, but then it goes on to say how many units are in that structure. So the parcel of land itself is classified as two family because of the multiple dwellings, but that's why there's one card for each structure. But each one says a two family dwelling. And I, right, that's because that's, I, but that's how the land is classified, not the structure. It goes, if you read the next line, it yes. tells you how many units are in each structure. No, I saw that. I just, yeah. it was just surprising. Uh, it, ha it, just, it has to do with assessing the land as a single family property or only having one. Um, and Mr. Chairman, with, with regards to the district, this would actually be, the trailer is not going to go away. They can replace the trailer. This will, however, get a brand new Title V septic system on that house. 
I would go so far as saying if the board wanted to put a condition that the existing home also has a new Title V septic system put in, that would be two new compliant septic systems rather than cesspools that are leaching into the groundwater. I'm pretty sure the Machados would be okay with, with doing that um, for the ability to construct this new single family home. So they're not leaving the property. Um, the parcels exceed the area requirement for the district. So that's what the zoning does. It but tells they you want to subdivide into two separate lots. That's correct. I just, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm understanding so it's not this one parcel that remains. I'm not going to create two, not two other parcels. Because what, what, what we're trying to do is to get rid of a nonconformity with having multiple dwellings on a single lot. No, no I, I understand. Okay. Um, okay. Any other board members? Uh, Dan, any questions? Jim Calkins? Yeah, I was just wondering what, what, I don't see road access to the back, or to parcel two. Right now, um, Jim, there's a singular driveway that comes off of Indian Town Road and then traverses in front of the house at number 900. And the driveway to access <coughs> parcel two utilizes that same access. So they do have a common driveway now, and that would be maintained. We would have to, we would have to put an easement on parcel one to get through to parcel two, but the driveway as it exists um, will remain and the access will remain the same. Could I ask uh, Jim? Well, well, let me see it from the board. Yeah. Go ahead. So that was Jim Corkin. Uh, Ka John Frank, questions, anything? Carolyn? You're muted, I'm Carolyn. Muted, Carol. okay. One minute, Carolyn, we can't hear you. Dan, you said that if this is allowed, it's going to make the lot more conforming, but isn't it just going to increase the non-conforming? It's gonna expand it. No, what's gonna happen is it's currently non-conforming due to frontage. That's the only non-conformity that, that will still exist. It's non-conforming now due to frontage and multiple dwellings on a single lot. So we're gonna be getting rid of one of the non-conformities, which is two, parts, two dwellings on one lot. So we'll have one house on one lot, one house on the other, and we'll, we're still gonna have a lack of frontage. But, but then both lots won't be conforming yeah, I think to what Carol because of lack of frontage, correct. She's going to 8634B um, or A, no building structure or land shall hereafter be used or occupied and no building or structure or part thereof shall be hereafter be erected, constructed, reconstructed, moved, or structurally altered except in conformity with all of the applicable regulations in the chapter. So you've got the prohibition. Well, that's, why we're, that's why we're here. No, no, I know, right. but yeah. I'm saying we, the prohibition for that, us to look at find. it sure. is, is saying, listen, th this is what, you, I think that's where Carolyn was coming from. I don't. Yeah, that's don't what I'm saying. Don't let me put words in your mouth, Carolyn. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I mean, I, I think, I, I would find it hard that, that anybody would think um, that the removal of this motorhome, the construction of a new home, it's not, the construction of, let me no, finish. It's not a motorhome. Motor, it's not a motorhome. What is it? It's not a motorhome. No, it's a mobile home, mobile sorry. Home, so yeah. it's situated on the ground. That there, there, there are no tires. It's a, it's a fixed structure on the ground. Um, so again, getting rid of that mobile home that's very close to the, the abutter on Indian Town Road, uh, constructing a new home, increasing the value of, of the surrounding homes, and construct, constructing two new Title V compliant septic systems clearly is a drastic improvement to the area, not only aesthetically, but environmentally. And that's the purpose of this zoning district, is, is to promote the, uh, the increased safety and environmental challenges that, that building single family homes meet. Thank you. Is it Carolyn? John, any, anything else? Dan? No. I'm gonna let, I know there were some objectives or in favor, I will ask you, but the director of planning wanted to say something, so let's see if what he had to say that maybe that will assist us. Yeah, I just had a, two, two things. First, just so I understand, to access parcel two, if this were approved, you'd have an easement that would pass in front of the existing number 900 to get over there? Is that either, the either in front or behind, depending right. upon 
Yeah. What Just wondering why you didn't show that on here. It might have been helpful to well, he's got because 30, it's existing now. You've got it. Thirty-six, thirty-six. You got it in front of. That's going to go to parcel number two. Am I looking at the wrong plan? Or I think I, I don't. I don't see a driveway going to parcel two on this proposal. No, it's 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 currently there. It's not shown on this plan, but there is a driveway now. They don't walk from Indian Town Road and get to the house. No, but you split it on the plan. You split the 72 by 36 and 36. For frontage. He's asking about a driveway. Oh, so those yeah, lines. You said that you would need an easement after this was done. Yeah, let me show you on here. So right now, the driveway starts here. Singular driveway. Comes up this line and cuts in front of this house and goes over to parcel two. So that's the driveway. So the right allocation now, wasn't 32, 36 and 36. If we create this parcel one, this driveway that currently goes over there, we would need to provide an easement here. Right, that's what I'm asking, why you didn't show that on, on the proposed plan. Because then we're not sure where that driveway is going to be. You're Suppose not sure where it's going to be. Okay. They may right. want to put the driveway here so they're not passing in front of that house. All right, I understand. And the, and the other question I had really goes back to your comments, uh, Mr. Chairman, about uh, sort of the philosophy of the zoning uh, ordinances to, uh, if a nonconformity, well, it shouldn't be expanded. Uh, it should be amortized over be, time if it goes it away. Let it, let it die. It. Let it die. And it just occurred to me that the argument that moving forward with an approval here with conditions that the septic systems be improved is not really an argument that's apropos to that, to that issue. No, it restarts it. It starts a new life. Right, but what I'm saying is that that to me is not a justification for for allowing the, um, uh, the petition to be allowed. Okay. Oh, that you'd on. have new septic. I mean, there are other ways that that septic system are addressed in the laws. So. Okay, that's. You want to respond to it? No. no. All right, thank you. Is that it? That's so now I know that there are people out there in favor. And so let me ask who's in favor. Is there anyone who's attending the meeting remotely who's in favor of this petition? Well, I am. Can you hear me? Uh, I can, if you can identify yourself, please. And my name is, I'm Melody Machado, and my husband here, we're the homeowners, the landowners and whatnot, and we... we Are you the young lady that wrote the letter in opposition? Was it opposition? No, she's, no, she's no, in favor. No, I'm for it. Oh, she's you're for it. Okay, good. It's the owner's wife. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, we, we're, uh, this lady's been here in this house for longer before we even bought the place, and... Um, you know, it, it was kind of a condition to allow her to be there when we bought this place from the gentleman who has now passed and had sold it to someone else. I mean, we're, we want to let her be there. That house has been there before anybody else's, uh, up, up, who borders us. And we, we just need to, you know, make improvements here because, you know, what else are we going to do with this, with this property? I mean, uh, it's, we live there. We've been there over 31 years and done everything we can. And nobody even knows we're there. We live so quietly. We don't, you know, uh, destruct anything. I, we gotta ha have be able to put something here to to live in. I mean, you know, it's I just want it better than that. We we want it better the whole whole thing, you know, and and still let this lady live there, whose house has been there before anybody else's houses have been there. You know, we don't do anything to the property to destruct it. We, you know, I'm an environmental person, so I, I don't know what else to say except that we really do need to put something else there, you know, in order to live. So I, mean, I guess that's all I got to say. Um, you know, we, we have all these other borders. Uh, uh, the only other thing I can tell you is, well, not that this matters, but we have all these other people who border our property. We don't go to the back. I mean, when I was younger, I did. I wasn't, you know, but anyways, um, you know, and they managed to do things up to our border, but yet we have nothing we can do here, you know, um, and that, in that first house that is a, across from the little cottage, their house is actually so close to, to our property, which I always wondered how that happened. But anyways, we just do need to put something here it you know i i don't know what else to do that's why we're here um you know we bought the property as is and you know we've tried to make it better but uh, you know that's all i can say um you know so 
that's that's it, I guess. Thank you. Is there anyone else in favor of this petition? Is there anyone opposed to this petition? We. I got the letter. I don't have it in my package, but I know there's a letter of opposition from. Yes. Pacheco family. The Pacheco family. Um, planning. Nine sixty Indian Town Road. Yeah, I'm it? writing to you to let you know that we are against the variance request by Kevin Machado of 882 900 Indian Town Road and believe that this should not be approved by the board. This property is part of the watershed area and does not have the minimum amount of frontage required by the city uh, of Fall River. Thank you. The Pacheco family, 960 Indian Town Road. Uh, tell you that. So that's the only letter of opposition that we received. Correct. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question, please? Yes. Can you identify yourself, please? Yes. Uh, Terry Canula um, of Indian Town Road. I'm, I'm one of the abutters at 1036. Thank no, you. Good. You've got the floor. Okay. Uh, well, my, I'm sorry. Getting back to the, um, the access to parcel two, my uh, question is um, why the, um, the sketch or the uh, plans show that second 36 foot um, access going, it looks like it goes around parcel one to, to what, go to parcel two. Want me to respond? Yes. So I'm going to have, I'm going to have Dan Aggie, I'll respond to that. So what the mindset was there is that we were being cognizant of not creating a lot line that would require an additional zoning relief for having a setback to a property line. Currently, the single family home at 900, the existing setback to the lot line in front of it is currently non-conforming. If we were to put the lot line and give a strip in front of that home, what that would do is would create an additional variance that would be required. We were trying to limit any type of zoning relief that we were requesting solely to the frontage. We meet the area requirements. We meet the building setback requirements. The only thing that we're seeking with for relief is with regards to frontage, with which we currently don't meet already. So does that mean that they won't be doing this? McAllen? Was, so, was so that does an that mean answer, ma'am? Um, so does that mean that you won't be doing this? The separate entrance? The, the separate entrance? Um, it, it's my understanding, and, and maybe um, Ms. Machado can uh, answer better to that. No, we would, we would keep a singular driveway coming in off of Indian Town Road, and then it would split at a point once we got back past the narrow 76-foot uh, width of the strip. So the driveway that w is there now coming off of Indian Town, we would share one singular driveway. We would not have two going out to Indian Town, trying to limit the amount of disturbance that is, would currently be in between the two homes that are out front now. That's fine. I, yes. hope, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Is there anyone else opposed or in favor of this petition? Okay. So, members of the board, you've heard the petition, you've heard what they want to do. We're cognizant of what the ordinance says. Can I get a motion to grant with conditions? Can I get a motion to deny? Well, Carolyn, I think, is saying something, but I can't hear you. I would make a motion to deny. Okay. Oh, come on. Carolyn makes a motion to deny. Do I have a second? No, Jim, John, Dan, no, all right. Can I get a motion to grant? Well, what are we gonna do here? Yeah. Okay, well, we have, <laughs> we have to have something. I mean, I, I'll second Carolyn's motion if you want um, to move it along, um, but no. I'll second Carolyn's motion to deny. Any discussion on the motion? Dan? Yeah. Jim? John no Frank? Okay. 
So I have a motion made by Carolyn. I have a second by me. Uh, we've had no discussion on the motion. All those in favor? Dan Dupere? Yes. Jim Calkins? No. No. John Frank? No. No. Carolyn Morissette? Yes. No. Yes. Chairman, yes. The vote is three to two. Uh, that motion for denial is granted. The petition is denied. Thank you. No, you don't need four to, to it's four. For pass? To pass. No, no. You got th four what? out of five for, to grant. For, for the. To grant. It's not granted. The motion. The motion was to deny. To deny. Correct. So yes. do you, don't you, you need four votes no. for that to pass? No. Just to grant. No. Four to, to grant. Oh, four I understand to, you need that. four to grant, the supermajority to grant. Yeah. So you have for the motion I, to deny. I just don't know how the motion carries for deny if it doesn't have the super same supermajority. The soup for it to be granted under four. I know I'm not saying to be granted. I understand. No, no. That. You, you, so the motion because you don't have the number of votes that the motion the motion to deny doesn't have to be Motion to grants have to be super majority. Motion to grant, you've got right. three against and two for. The petition doesn't go forward. You don't need a super majority to deny. Okay. Just a majority. I would understand that if it was the motion to grant that didn't carry, but that's fine. You have agenda item number, oh, what time yeah, are we doing right that right. one? Yeah, seven o'clock? Is it seven? It's a waste of time. We tried. We did. We did. Okay, we'll move on to agenda item number four. Kevin Aguiar, 4450 Coral Street, lot F216. A special permit request pursuant to section 86423B to subdivide the existing 7,732 plus or minus square foot parcel into two parcels, leaving an existing residence on each proposed lot one, 3,000 plus or minus square feet, lot two, 4,700 plus or minus square feet. Good evening again for the record, Dan Aguiar from SciTech Engineering. Here this evening on behalf of Kevin Aguiar, the applicant who is the owner of the real estate at 44 and 50 Coral Street. As the chairman stated, this is a special permit request under 86423B under the old book. Not sure what the new section is now. I tried purchasing a new one today, but I haven't gotten it yet. It's um, uh, still 86423, now it's paragraph B. It's so it's B. subsection okay. B. Um, so as you see in your package, we have an existing parcel of land that is located in the R4 district. Um, there are multiple dwellings on the property that have been constructed prior to 1954 and under 86423B, um, we can potentially be afforded a special permit that allows the subdivision of the two parcels. What we would have is parcel two, which would contain a single family cottage to the rear of the property, provided with 12 feet of access out to Coral Street. And then the existing three-family dwelling would maintain 43 feet of frontage on Coral uh, with a minimum rear yard setback of four feet at that bulkhead to make sure that people can get in and out of that bulkhead area. Um, and then a six-foot setback to the porch uh, to the home in the rear. Eight feet on the three-family dwelling in between that two, uh, that lot line to make sure that the homeowner of 44 and 48 would have the ability to traverse the property uh, and get around to the rear of the property. So it's a rather straightforward application, uh, again, under that provision of zoning that allows by special permit to subdivide these two houses on one parcel of land. That's all. Um, Sorry, Dan. Um, Go ahead, Karen. When, the, when was it constructed? What year? I just didn't hear what you said. I believe it's listed. It should be in your package. I believe it's stated 1900, but prior to 1954. Thank you. Yep. Dan, is that, would there be any issue if there were conditions of, well, certainly separate utilities if it's in order to grant separate utilities with the affidavit being recorded and no fences to separate? Um, I, I, I would think that no fences up that narrow lot line 
but maybe a lot maybe allow the fence along the driveway no fences no fence yeah exactly so emergency but the, vehicles between can, the two can pull the, 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 what happens is there is an existing driveway there now. <coughs> Again, this is the house that I grew up in. Yeah, I know it is the ancestral <laughs> so home. The driveway yeah. itself, it, it's almost, um, I don't pull into the driveway because it's so steep, um, but you can physically get up into that driveway. Um, so yeah, through, through that narrow 12 foot strip, I would agree that, that no fences should be constructed in that, in that location. Okay. Any other questions, members of the board? Dan, Jim? John? Yeah, I just on uh, yep. that discussion, uh, we want no def no fences on one side, but there's nothing that would prevent a fence on the other side. Of no, the that's that's what we're saying. No fence. The new dividing line. The the new dividing line that goes from. Oh, okay. Let me find the north arrow. Where's I'm the show you on the, the plan. Jim, can you see the drawing? Yeah. So I've got it right here. So this new lot line that we're doing <coughs> here there would be no fence constructed, so that way it would be traversable for that entire width from the existing house, because there actually is an existing fence on that existing lot line. So the newly created lot line, uh, okay. 12 feet parallel. Yeah, I, no I, that was my only concern, that I, I didn't see any reason we couldn't have a fence between that and the other existing house. No, between okay. that other one, yeah, to separate yeah. the bulkhead from the stairs, yes, but going up the driveway, that was just one of my... I've lived through that a couple of times with some cases and it has not worked out well. Yep. Uh, okay. John Frank, any questions? Any comments? Carolyn? No. No. Director, any questions? No, no thank you. All right, so that's, the, um, that's what's before us. Can we get them under the special permitting under this? All we need to do is make sure that we have a finding that the division is made in a way to maximize the use of the proposed lots specifically access, parking, and yard area. So they've dealt with the um, uh, access, they've dealt with the yard area, um, and parking. Uh, currently, the three-family dwelling, uh, whether it has parking or not, it's probably on the street, on the street park. This is directly behind um, what was A&P, and now it's the Rite Aid, um, and parking on the street. They've actually just closed up all of the, there used to be curb openings from Rite Aid onto Coral. And they've actually just closed all that up, so it's created quite a bit of new parking new on the parking street. Mm. Park. Okay. So we've heard that. Can I get, so we need to have, if we're going uh, to Mr. grant. Chairman, before yes. you, I, I see one other block lit up. Is, is that somebody that might be opposed? Or oh, I don't know. Is there anyone in favor of this favorite? petition? Is there anyone opposed to this petition? Ray, I see Ray. Just wanted to cover us. No, it's all right. I just. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, so not hearing anybody in favor, anybody opposed to it, can I get a motion to grant, motion to deny? If we have a motion to grant, then part of the motion has to be that there's a specific finding that the division is made in a way to maximize the use of the proposed lots, specifically access, parking, and yard area. Dan? Jim? Uh I move that we find or grant the uh, request and find that uh, it would not in, uh, or would not be detrimental and would increase the proposed whatever. <laughs> uh, to maximize the use of the proposed lot, specifically right. access parking and yacht area. Right. And the conditions I heard you say separate utilities with the affidavit being recorded within a year. And no fence, no fences along the uh, 12 foot ec um, driveway. That's what I said. Yep. That's what I thought. Uh, can I, do I have a second on that motion? I'll second. Second by Dan second. Uh Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Jim Calkins. Yes. Aye. Carolyn. Yes. John Frank. Yes. I see the finger up. Yeah. Dan. Yes. <laughs> Chairman. Yes. All right, so that, wait, it's a special permit. Do you, do you need, I don't want you back in a year, yeah, is it two well, years? Well, if, I would ask if, if we have two years that the affidavit run the two years as well. Okay, so Jim, can we modify your motion it's because it's a I hope that since uh, the courts are still backed up with the virus that we grant two years of time for the execution and the recording of the uh, documentation. All right, and, and the, the special permit is a grant for two years. 
Right. So we'll run it out so he doesn't have to come back if something happens. Yes? All right, yes. so that's, that's Jim's motion is modified. Second, Second by Dan Dupier. All those in favor? Dan, yes. yes. John Frank, yes. Jim Calkins, yes. Vice Chair yes. Carolyn? Yes. Yes. Aside, yes. So that's been granted with Thank those you. conditions. Are we ready for, am I there for um, 715? Yes, 719. Okay, 715. Uh, Cund Helstead the second, 502 506 4th Street, <clears throat> lot I-1241. This is a special permit request pursuant to 86423B to subdivide the existing. 5,390 plus or minus square foot parcel into two 2,600 plus or minus square foot parcels, leaving an existing residence on each in the A2 district. Good evening again for the record, Dan Aguiar of SciTech Engineering. Here this evening on behalf of Nud Hellestead, who is the property owner of this real estate at 502 through 506 4th Street. Again, identical to the previous petition, uh, just on a little bit smaller of a lot, uh, and with two dwellings that have a higher density. We have an existing five family in the front, constructed in 1900, and an existing three family in the rear. Um, there is some uh, existing driveway for three spaces, as you can see we have shown on the plan and within that little 10 foot driveway strip. In a situation like this, as the chairman alluded to at the last hearing, no fences should be constructed along the new dividing line here because of the proximity um, from one building to the other. And, and the board, under previous petitions, the, the previous planner um, did not want to see easement lines clouding up a plan like this or even a form A. He would always ask for a separate document. However, I would think that it would be appropriate um, that uh, an easement be granted along that lot line four feet on either side uh, just to make things easier to pass. If, if one gentleman, for instance, needed to get a a bobcat or deliver something to the rear, at least he would have an eight foot strip straddling the lot line to do so. So what I would recommend is no fences at all in that an easement straddling the lot line up until the building limits uh, be prepared and shown on the Form A plan. Other than that, it's an identical uh, situation as the previous. No, that, that was going to be my suggestion because I'm looking at the tightness of it it's and without tight. that it's going to be very difficult for both, if two new owners have it, to right. transverse uh, the area. Um, no question about the um, s separate utilities? Nope, I believe it's already done. Okay, well, right. if, you, if it's done then maybe yeah. an affidavit can already be filed. All right, so those are my only comments. I think, again, under 86.423, paragraph B, uh, they have the right to come before the board and ask for a special permit to do it. Uh, and the board has to find that the division is made in a way to maximize the use of the proposed lot, specifically access, parking, and yard area. Um, you, you're showing three spaces. So would there really be three off-street parking spaces there? Yeah, that they would be stacked, and it would, it would basically be to the existing okay. three-family in the back. All right, so those are my only comments. Uh, and Dan? <laughs> Jim Calkins? Yeah, I, my, my concern was uh, the parking access. If the owner of Parks 01 wanted to park in the first space, how does the person in the second parcel get into his parking space? And, I, and Dan explained that you're just giving a wider uh, right away, I guess, to, to get there. Well, you have the four foot easement to get in. Percy and coming from that. Dan? Not Dan. Uh, John? No, no comment. Carolyn? No. No? Okay. Is there anyone here? Here, Director, anything you no want to add? No comments. No, thank you. Is there anyone here in favor of this petition? Is there anyone opposed to this petition? Okay. Can I get a motion to grant with conditions, a motion to deny? What do you want to do? I make a motion to grant. Dan Dupier makes a motion to grant. Uh, with the specific findings that the proposed lots, uh, specifically access, parking, and yard area have been maximized. Um, that I think you said what separate utilities, if they're not already done, the affidavit to be, and no fences, no fences. to be used. No fences at all. Okay. So that was Dan's motion as I understood it. Uh, do I have a second on the motion? 
Second. Second. John Frank. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Dan Dupere. Aye. Jim Calkins. Aye. Yes. John Frank. Yes. Yeah. Carolyn Morissette. Yes. Yes. Chairman Assad. Yes. That petition is granted with two-year grant. Can we be clear on that? Two-year grant for this one? Yes. Two-year two -year grant. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that's agenda item number five. Is it 730 yet? No. No. Okay. We'll stand waiting for 730. That's a special permit also. Jim, you have time to run to the uh, refrigerator if you need to. Oh, uh, it's a long way away. <laughs> he has water on the side of the way. <laughs> We've been what, sir? Oh, we saw two, right? Two different ones. Really? Yeah, I saw. That's the problem when, you, when they post a link publicly without getting it from the. We didn't from the so you did a good job of getting rid of it. Yeah. Oh, Ray was, he was just, he was just a guy hanging yeah, out. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Dan, did you, did you say you saw the link on a public ad? Brittany was just saying well, that the it. link is now on the website on so the anybody can the... join. But that was, but she said that's what. Well, the way the, I had set it up originally was if, if the ad the says link. if you're interested, right. call us, we'll give you the link. Right. No, but I guess so when she called the state, said, they she's, said to, to she's post the, it. That's AG, why she posted the on the AG's yeah. office said after Patrick Higgins gave us a heads up that he was going to complain about it, yeah. that it has to so, be open to the public. So that's why she's posted that's it on correct. the notice that goes to the clerk's office. That's correct. Or on the website. On the wherever. Yeah. So easy yeah. access, anyone that needs to be there. There's other workarounds that we haven't done with this yet, but we can make people register beforehand. Yes. No, no, that, that'll work. I do, we just need to, I don't know if Brittany's here, but we should probably run that by the attorney to make sure because the issue that arose with Patrick Higgins and the town, I think it was Swansea, mm -hmm. they weren't doing it. And some, was it Somerset? Um, and we, they said you have to have access, anybody that wants to come to the meeting. And the other thing we can do is we can enable a waiting room so anybody that tries to walk in gets put in the waiting room. The only issue with that is I won't know who right. Did they say anything about logging in? He had a good idea. Log Regis registering when you log register in. Register who you are. So we don't. And they can register. Well, the public has a right to view the meeting without giving their name. So there you go. They, the, the open, there's two parts to it. So the open meeting law has their own laws, and then our meetings and like hearings yeah. have our own rules. The open meeting law only protects the public from um, hearing. And if they want to participate, we can't block them from the participating of the meeting. But our hearing rules being separate from that, um, we don't require them, there's no way to require them to say, you have to give us your name. Anybody can show up to a Show meeting. up, watch, listen, do yeah, whatever. You and, don't and have to say who you are. We have but, but under the Zoom protocol, can't we just block off their video? And Mike, until it time comes time to call for. Uh, oh no! I think that's what Alex does. Problem. No, because we we had video showing what was going on. We had audio, and they both could be blocked off except for the members of the board during the uh, presentations. So when everybody logs in at the beginning, you can set them as primary, like. I probably shouldn't admit to that, Jim. I thought you. I thought it was just open to us. I didn't know that you could hear other people. And that oh yes, yeah, we heard some wonderful things. Oh, yeah. I didn't which, hear much. Which we didn't hear. Well, well obviously I heard, he heard them, but I, 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 I didn't hear much. Out. I just saw the dancing baby or something. Yeah. Uh, a lot of vulgarity. Oh. 
they did. Yeah. Oh, they heard it. We didn't hear it. Uh, yeah, Dave, the funny thing is that even a lot of the classrooms that have been using Zoom, um, there's hackers that can get into these Zoom rooms, and it's caused quite a problem with the same type of thing happening with a young audience sitting there with their teacher. Yeah. With nobody to hit the button like we yeah. have. Do we, th there's got to be a delay. What is it, two second or three second delay? No? No. No. Because I'm saying he was very good at just like it ended. Yeah, no, I just thought it going off. Yeah, I saw, I saw no, no, we could hear it. We heard you, and you saw. You could hear it. Yeah. Okay, good. Well. Hey, you warned us of that. Like, but but there, I, I think that uh, there are settings that you can make that it mutes on entry, and then the facilitator can open up whichever ones he wants open uh, on an individual basis. So when when you enter, if they all were muted and, and no, but no you can do that when I ask. But when when he's doing his presentation, if you just have the board members, yeah. that's perfect. And then when I ask whether or not Public there's anybody comment. in favor or opposed, then you can open it up and they can all scream. Time, maybe, yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. Without video. Okay. Yeah, because that way all the board members, uh, we, we, they can scream and yell all they want. Uh, it's the outside public that we want to have a little bit more control about. Okay, now that sounds like it'll work. Technical question. When, when this gets aired to the uh, public, is it legal to edit out that? The, that those sections? I don't think so. No. I don't no, think Alex we can Alex edit. Has I think done we... some editing for things that are not pertaining to the meeting, right? Right. We, like you're not going to have swearing on Fall River Government TV. Yeah, so that stuff wasn't, like, just because you guys don't see it in here doesn't mean that that's what we're recording. I see. So we have the other cameras that are shooting. So what happened was when that stuff popped up, we were actually off the reaction. Yeah. Well, we haven't. Pe we haven't accepted. Fall River Government TV is our official uh, minutes because if we did, we'd be have minutes for everything, right? Well, they do have minutes for everything. No, 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 no. They're, no, not, no. they're but not accepted. For that's not minutes. that's not the official that's not the official zoning. So yeah, I think you can't do what you want to do. Yeah, just, You're just doing your own audio yeah, and video. Okay. Like anything, okay. We're there. It's seven, seven thirty. Yes. Okay. Well, okay, Brittany, I'm going to start. You're going to open the door. No. Seven thirty, Brian Brinier, sixty-one seventy-one Stewart Street, lot S nine twenty-five. Special permit request pursuant to section eighty-six four twenty-three B to subdivide fifteen thousand plus or minus square foot parcel into two 7,500 square foot parcels, leaving an existing residence on each in the BN district. Good evening. As you can see, in the month of March, we had a run on section 86423B. <laughs> I think we have one or two more coming up after this. Uh, so similarly, again, to the two previous uh, petitions, uh, again, this is a much larger parcel of land, which is always good. Uh, we have an existing three-family dwelling and an existing single-family dwelling currently on, um, on Stewart Street. Again, in your packages, you'll see that both structures were constructed in approximately 1900, meeting the criteria for 86423B. There is currently a paved parking area with existing parking spaces uh, and an existing fence. Uh, so we have been able to provide five off-street parking spaces, and those are currently constructed. I do believe utilities are already separated, but however, you know, a, a condition to make sure that the affidavit gets put on record is fine as well. Um, fencing on this one, I don't see an issue with, with any fencing, uh, but if the, if the board uh, wanted to, I could see potentially no fencing through the parking area up to the existing fence maybe, just so that getting in and out might be a little bit easier. Um, but other than that, it's a pretty straightforward application we have 50 feet of frontage on each lot and 7500 square feet for each as well that's all okay you think utilities have already been split well you should do I, the affidavit i believe they have but absolutely do the affidavit i think we should do the sure. affidavit if we grant i mean we may deny it i don't know so is there, Mr. Chairman, I, I was wondering, or, 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 dan I, I was wondering if 
this is a case where we might add the qualification and no further uh, subdivisions of that lot. You can certainly As I do. look at the adjacent lots, they've got several of them have the, the front back type of units. Yeah, I, I don't you can cer you can that. certainly we can certainly do that. Grant the special permit with the condition that no further subdivision or no further development. I just wonder what the owner's uh, opinion of that would be. I don't think with with regard to the subdivision, I, I don't think yes. that's an issue. Um, what I would suggest is potentially that if you make a condition regarding any further development, um, where the single family house is rather small. Um, just that any proposed addition needs to meet the building setback requirements or something to that nature. Um, they're not going to. Yeah, no, I'm not. I wouldn't. I wouldn't prevent him from developing it if he for that. But I mean, no second house. Or oh no, absolutely no second house. But if they want because to because you're in that B N district that these are pre-existing non-conforming anyway. Right. So they need to come back for relief. So you can put Jim. If you're thinking along those lines, you can put that condition in. Yeah, I mean, we're just getting hit with so many of those type of uh, micro It's a lot. It's lot. the largest lots that we've seen tonight. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, Jim? No. John? Dan? No. Carolyn? Questions? No? Is there anyone here in... Well, Mr. Director? No, he's got nothing to say. Uh, is there anyone here in favor of this petition? Is there anyone here opposed to this petition? Okay. okay. If you're thinking, can we get a motion to grant with the conditions? If you want, deny. Uh, the motion to grant should be that we find that the division is made in a way to maximize the use of the proposed lots, specifically access, parking, and yard area. And we should probably give it a grant for two years. Um, and the affidavit to be filed in two years that the utilities have been split or before there's a sale. Okay. So, uh, so that's, if you want to deny, we'll just do a motion to deny. Yeah, motion to grant. Motion to grant with, the, with those conditions. conditions yeah. um, so Dan Dupier made that motion to grant uh, that the division is being made in a way to maximize the use of the proposed lot, specifically access, parking, and yard area, that it's a two-year grant, no, um, an affidavit to be recorded within two years or before the transfer of either property, um, no further and no, fur no further subdivision of the lots. Separate utilities. Is there. Yeah, separate utilities with the affidavit to be recorded before the sale or within two years. Yeah. That's his motion. Is that a second by you, Jim Calkins? Second. Oh, that John Frank, do you have a question? No, second. Oh, John Frank seconded the motion. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Jim Calkins? Yes. John Frank? Yes. Dan Dupere? Yes. Carol Morissette? Yes. Saad, yes. So that petition's granted with those conditions. Thank you. Is it? It's not 745 no. yet, is it? Yeah. Number seven, 1148 Duval Street, LLC. 1148 Duval Street, 201 Remington Avenue, lot S22, 6 and 2. This is a special permit request pursuant to section 86175 to allow construction of a 12-story, 150-foot tall mixed-use building which would contain 200 apartment units and commercial space, providing 257 parking spaces while raising the three existing structures in the Waterfront Transit Orient District, lot size 91,755 plus or minus square feet. Good evening, will you identify yourself for the record, please? Certainly, good evening again for the record, Dan Aguiar of SciTech Engineering, here this evening on behalf of 1148 Duval Street, LLC. Their managing uh, member, Mike Kamara, is here this evening as well. I would like to thank the board for the, taking the time to come and look at this petition this evening. And as the chairman stated, this is a very narrow um, request of relief. And under that section of the bylaw 86175, we are dealing only with the height of the building and the number of stories in the building. And that would be the limit that we could get to. 
we don't have a formal building designed yet so th this would give the architect the ability to have some limits of what he could put together so getting into the petition itself on the drawing that you see that I have up here now um, the property uh, is located in between Duval Street and Remington uh, Remington runs along the west side of the property Duval Street along the east you would all know it as the Allen Paul's auto sales auto repair rental over time that's this front building which would be the larger brick building at 1148 in the middle of the site there is currently a steel uh, metal building uh, utilized as a fitness center for heritage crossfit and then at the very bottom there is another steel uh, panel building that's utilized as a uh, commercial warehouse garage space the entire lot as you see shown here is entirely impervious all pavement um, it is in a WTOD district and I think it's important to understand what the requirements are in that district um, so it was created a number of years ago to provide the ability to create apartment style housing large-scale apartment style housing and if you read through that section of zoning um, by right we can construct a six-story building number of units is unlimited it's basically driven by the number of parking spaces that you can provide so it, there are a few variables that go into the equation of what we can propose on a plan to, to, to submit before you uh, if we cap the building at a six-story height we would not be before this board that would be a by right proposal the problem with doing that is if we kept with a six-story building we would now have a building that would encompass the entire width of the parcel and most of the depth of the parcel with decks of garaging underneath so there probably wouldn't be a lot of exterior spaces to get to the number of units that makes the project viable so so that's what we're dealing with so when we take a look at what the proposal could be um, we discussed all right what are we trying to accomplish here a number of things we need to create X number of units X number of parking spaces what is the best way to do that while keeping things like views of the waterfront, views of something other than just a straight line of building. So when we took a look at that, what I can show you what we came up with. <coughs> so what we did was, as I was saying before, if, if we went to a building that was only six stories in height, the building setbacks here are only 10 feet. So what we would need to do is take this building and basically double it in square footage. So take this footprint, take the whole thing, and double it. That would give us a 12-story building cut in half is two sixes. So square footage-wise, what you see shaded in pink would be double on this plan. And what that, what that would do would be basically block any type of view that anybody would have of the river because you would still be looking through a six-story building. Very similarly, if you look to the south, would be the Commonwealth Landing Building, which is a six-story building. I think if you are up gradient or across Route 79 from that Commonwealth Landing Building, you can't see over it and down quick enough to see water. What you can do is off to the left of it and off to the right of it, you can get views of water in, in different directions. If that building was narrower and deeper, similar to the way that we have it there would be corridors in between building to building that would allow views to be preserved the height of the building whether it's a six-story building or a 12-story building will not change views of the water dramatically it may be a little bit of a different view because now you're going to have this wide mass where it's going to be blacked out from this property line so you get past commonwealth landing what this will allow you to do is to have two different corridors of view, which is what we were trying to do. We wanted to create the smallest footprint that gave us the same number of units while providing the required parking. So what we have proposed here is a 12-story building. One of the stories is actually subterranean. It would be a garage accessed only from the lower westerly end of the site. So from the Duval Street site, you're actually only seeing 11 stories, 10 which would be apartments, and one floor would be provided for retail or different types of restaurants and things of that nature, all allowed in the district. So all of those types of items 
aren't even up for discussion. What we're here solely to discuss is that the board has the ability to grant a special permit to get to a 12-story building no in excess of 150 feet. If you continue further down Duval Street, you'll see Point Gloria. Again, a building similar in size and scale, but the shape of it is rather square. So it blocks off a very large portion of the waterfront. That building is actually, I believe, 13 stories with one or two decks underneath, and it's actually 179 feet tall according to the building records. So that, that building is larger than what we have here, dramatically. When you look along the city's skyline, in districts outside of the WTOD, you will see a number of high rises that are scattered throughout the city. Some of them are as high as 18 stories high. So we're not getting to that, to that point. So I don't want someone to think, well, you're taking the Millican Apartments or the two buildings that are in that area and plopping that down. No, those buildings are much larger than what we're proposing here. And it's an entirely different type of housing. There's no parking there that's entirely different, couldn't be further from what we want to do. When we take this building in this shape, what it also does is it allows us to create the parking lots with an increase in landscaping and green space, which currently does not exist on the site. So right now, this site is grandfathered with 100% impervious cover. So yes, we could build a six-story building, wide, square, and take up all of the land and have no green space. That's allowed by right. The applicant does not want that to happen. What we're attempting to do is keep those corridors open and be able to keep some views of the area as well. What we have also done is, you'll see as you're heading south on Duval Street, you'll see that what we've done is we've taken the building and we've slid it as far west as we possibly can. We're limited by the floodplain that you see in the dark bold lines on that westerly boundary. And what we wanted to do and we wanted to ensure was that as you're driving down Duval Street, this building does not block Commonwealth Landing. I think as you drive down Commonwealth, down Duval Street and you see that corner of Commonwealth Landing as you're driving by, we think that's a great view when you're traversing through that area. So we didn't want to impede that. So we've pushed the building as far off of Duval. So that also gives, keeps the views of Commonwealth. And then it also doesn't give you the feel of right against Duval Street pavement, you're looking up at a 12-story building. So giving some depth to that front yard helps with the relief of dealing with the building of that height. Again, as I stated, in the bylaw, there are a number of parking requirements based upon the number of units. We've exceeded those requirements. Uh, on the plan, you'll see that we've created a total of 200, I need my glasses, 257, 257 spaces, 57, I believe. We've created 257 spaces. Uh, 250 are required. 215 of those spaces would be exterior to the parking lot, and 42 of them would be interior spaces in the garage that are accessed um, by the driveway from the Remington uh, Avenue location. Something else when we, when we looked into this, we wanted to make sure that the circulation around this building not only created a pedestrian safe environment, you'll see the number of sidewalks that we've provided around the property itself. Um, travel lanes are at the city's requirement of minimum of 22 feet. We have vehicular access from two driveways on Duval Street and then you can also exit out through Remington and vice versa. You can come in both directions. So we made sure that we provided a safe environment for pedestrians, that fire access and things like that could, could be ensured. Um, a project of this size, of course, would have to go through site plan review to deal with landscaping and drainage and lighting and things of that nature. Um, drainage, we're only going to be improving it by getting rid of a large amount of the impervious surface that's currently on the site. Uh, so we'd be removing asphalt while constructing this building. What I did do so that you can get an idea, and I want to make sure that you understand that this is not exactly the building that we're going to be building, but I was able to find in Seattle, Washington, there's a building called the Denny Building. And, and don't think it was ingenious to go find this. If you Google 12-story apartment building, you find images of them. So I was able to sort through a number of them and found a building very similar in general shape and scale. It's a 12-story building, and that one is a true 12-story building without the parking deck underneath, but similar where it's narrow in the front, deeper in depth. It comes in bays basically of 20-foot units that would bring you all the way down to the rear of the building. So that would generally be the size and scale of the building. 
I don't want to make, make sure that you understand that you're not approving this building. There were no architectural requirements under the, the zoning bylaw. So what we're trying to do, as I stated before, is come up with a limit that an architect, which I am not, um, can put together some designs, what could be feasible on this site. So what we're here tonight is to set limits. We may not get to a 12-story building. We may not get to 150 feet, but we could get up to that point or smaller. Same thing with the number of units. We may find that marketing-wise, the 200 units is too much. We may have to make some units bigger. We may have to cut it down. So <clears throat> those limits of what we put in the petition, those are just that, limits. We cannot exceed those numbers, um, and most likely we'll be a little bit below them. Also on this plan, just for, so you can get an idea if you don't clearly understand where we're at, again, here is Route 79 running north to south to Wall Street in this location with the yellow outline would be our parcel. To the very north would be the Coca-Cola building. Next over we have a warehouse building that actually sits very low, and then Commonwealth Landing directly to our south. So you can get a good idea of what this footprint is in comparison to the buildings that are around us. Yes, we're taller, but look at the urban sprawl that occurs with these other larger, lower buildings where we've been able to compact it in this narrower, longer building um, that keeps the views of the water as well. I think in general, um, that's the presentation that I would like to give to you. If you have specific questions regarding any items, I'd be more than glad to answer them. Again, this is a very narrow scope. It's a special permit solely dealing with the height of the building and the number of stories. But if you have questions beyond that, please feel free to ask. Basically, you're just looking for approval to use the special permit to go maximum 150 feet um, or t 12 stories, whichever. That's correct. Uh, and that's. And in, in, in some of the apartment, some of the other apartments, uh, buildings that I presented to you, um, you will probably recall that most of them require some type of parking um, deficit where we've cut down the number of parking that's required. We've made sure that we've balanced this site to get the maximum number of units without any relief in parking. No, I've, I reviewed the petition. I mean, in all respects, you meet the, you meet the zoning bylaw, especially for the special permit. Um, and it's just you don't have the architectural design, so what you really have is, uh, here's the building envelope that I want to use. This is, uh, and all the other issues concerning lighting and shadowing and light and air are going to be brought up in um, site plan review. Right. Uh, Again, something and the that same thing with traffic patterns, and you're getting rid of impervious, and your proposal is to put more greeny, more greenery there. And okay, when I mean, I, I got the idea. I don't know. Yeah, when, when we looked at the building and the design, and it's more luck than anything else. But we have a property that runs east to west, um, with its being long in that direction. So everybody knows. The sun comes sun up here, rises in the east which is sets the east, in the west. and the sun will rotate in this direction and set directly in the west. Shadowing from this building would affect one parcel, which would be this commercial building next door. I think it's important to note that we're in a location and in an area that the city for many years has tried to give it a little bit of a boost and to find some way of, of giving it a little, a little pop. Commonwealth Landing did an incredible job. That's a great facility and it's thriving. Um, the fact that we do not have the owners of Commonwealth Landing or the building to the north, at least that I know of, um, here in opposition to this project, they all know about it very well. Uh, we're gonna see who's out there. Um, right, so, but I <laughs> expect that, that you won't find the people that should be concerned about this project if they were to have a concern aren't concerned about it. They're actually, they're looking forward to it. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the board, any questions? Dan. No. Jim. Jim Calkins, no. John Frank. Vice Chair Morissette. No. Okay. Um, is there anyone here in favor of this petition? Is there anyone here opposed to this petition? Yes. Can you hear me? I. Can you identify yourself? Is that Kenny? Yeah, it's uh, Ken Fiola. Okay, Ken Fiola, go ahead. 
Yeah, I might be coming up as Carol Fiola because I'm using her laptop, so it's actually Ken Fiola. Though. There's so, no name. I just happen to see the oh, face. Okay, thanks. So tell us what you're thinking. So um, I'm here and actually to, uh, to offer my support for this particular pro uh, project. Um, as you know... Um, is, this, is this you, Ken Fiola, individually, or you as representative uh, Bristol, of some... Uh, Bristol County Economic Development Consultants. Okay, thank you. Okay. So we, you know, for, for 20 years, um, you know, OED, or now BCEDC, has been working on this whole waterfront plan uh, so that we could be taking down Route 79, creating more developable acres. We also have been working with uh, the state to reestablish commuter rail, and we also worked uh, in the past with the city for the, the establishment of the TOD. And the whole emphasis on all those actions have been to create more mixed-use uh, residential uh, accommodations along the waterfront. Um, and I think some of the fruits of our labor are finally coming to fruition. It started off with Commonwealth Landing when nobody said that we could do uh, market rate apartments there. And today you have uh, 103 market rate units and you also have a pretty substantial waiting list that's taken place there. Uh, most notably, I think the, uh, the ZBA also had given uh, some prior zoning relief to a project that's taken place on the corner of the ball and Turner Street for the construction of a six story 49 units. Uh, that's going to be taking place later on this year. Um, the fact that, you know, the uh, state is not only committed to the commuter rail project, which will be operational by 2023, but they're also going to be moving forward with the $80 million uh, re, uh, raising of Route 79 and creating more than a million square feet of developable space there. I think just, you know, shows that this whole waterfront is going to be transformed. It's going to be transformed in a well thought out way so that things are going to be complementary to one another as opposed to be in competition to, to each other. Uh, we are not particularly concerned with the size of this building, um, you know, as the, as the uh, petitioner is requesting. You know, by right, they have the ability to do six stories. Um, they may go up to 12 stories, but that's going to be driven by market demand and the size of the units. I should also note that the uh, my understanding is that the the petitioner is also going to be looking to place market rate housing here as opposed to subsidized housing. So I think, you know, as this thing comes closer and closer to fruition in terms of the commuter rail coming online and Route 79 coming online and the city pier, uh, there'll be plans that are being a distant future in terms of more open space and visibility. The whole potential of the waterfront is starting to become realized. And in this particular case, what the city is going to benefit from is not only the introduction of new mockery units, of which there's a tremendous demand for right now, but it's also going to result in additional taxes uh, for the city, both in terms of real estate taxes new excise taxes as people may be moving into the city and registering their cars here. And overall, the site itself is going to become an amenity or the project itself will become an amenity, an amenity to, the, uh, to the overall waterfront by virtue of the fact that we are bringing in people into the city uh, that are going to occupy these units. Right now, just for your own edification and notice, you have 750 square foot one bedroom units <clears throat> renting out in the city um, for you know, anywhere between at a low of twelve fifty per month to a high of sixteen fifty per month, so there's a big demand for new units, and there's going to be you know these people that are coming in are doing so with disposable income, being part of the community that's going to help revitalize this community, help counter you know act as a counterbalance to the overall housing you know you know, equation as it currently exists within the city. But I think the, the, the positives of this project are self-evident, and I think this is going to become an important component within the overall development of the waterfront and an early action project. Um, I'm not sure that there's a market demand for 200 units right now. There could be, but I certainly know that there's a demand, you know, if you look at our past urban renewable plan studies, that study itself said there was a demand for, a demand for four to 500 mockery units.
Now, those may be in a different configuration as what being proposed here. But I know in just speaking with developers and being privy to some recent housing demand analysis, um, the, 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 the demand is there. It's all going to be dependent upon the finishes, the off street parking, and the amenities that are built that really drive these projects. So I just wanted to weigh in and say that, um, you know, from our perspective, this is the type of thing we've been trying to accommodate for years. I'm confident that at the end of the day, there'll be a project here that we will all be proud of, and it's not going to be detrimental to the city. And as uh, Mr. Aguiar previously noted, the configuration of this building and the fact that the building is also going to run east to west is long and narrow. It's going to be less, much less invasive than even what Point Gloria was. And I think today, you know, Point Gloria, I think, is a, is a nice asset for the community. And it also presents uh, the public with opportunities for a different type of living accommodation. So I don't want to belabor the point, but I just wanted to get here before the board and advocate uh, for the approval of the, um, the petitioner's request. Thank you, Ken. Is there anyone else in favor of this petition? Is there anyone else opposed to this petition? Dan, do we know what the, of the 200 units, what the mix is going to be? One no, bedroom, two no, bedroom? No, we're, we're nowhere near that. But what we've done but is we provide... The model, the model will probably dictate how many units you're going to have. Yeah, one so bedroom, the, I mean, there, there will definitely be a blend. The way we've set up this building now is they're basically pods that are 24 by 37. So as, as Ken stated, a lot of the rental units now, and I've worked on a number of the buildings in mm -hmm. the city, um, they, they're renting down to 700 to 800 square feet. So this is going to have, give us the ability to have some maybe that small, maybe we have some that are 14, 15, or 16, depending upon what that is. I am not a marketing I'm just guru. wondering whether the, pro um, whether the but no, numbers so were... What this is going to do is this is going to give us the ability to give a framework to now go determine, oh. you know, what is the market, who wants to build it, you know, things of that nature. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, is there... What, yes, sir. I'll, I didn't... Are you opposed to this, sir? So this afternoon, wait, wait, excuse me for one minute. Uh, Christian Quintero Oliveira, the chairman of the Historical Commission. That's correct. Okay, so you're here for the Historical Commission. Correct. All right. So I'm not, I'm not going to read her letter since you're here. You tell us what your opposition or your position is on this project, please. We need your name. I didn't get Can it. Can you come up to that Maybe. microphone? Is that I don't know if it's hooked up. Um, no. But I can move oh, you. Can I don't mind. I, I can get up. I just don't know if he's uncomfortable sitting here. But. Well, I don't know. Alex, does that microphone mic on that table work? Yeah, it be. Okay. All right. So why don't, you, why don't you come sit right there so you can, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Identify yourself, please. Testing. Yep. Okay. This, this letter was late in coming. We had a meeting on Tuesday evening, the Historic Commission, and uh, we uh, established that there should be a letter written uh, to the authority, to the zoning board, and it was put together. We, we discussed this at length, and then the uh, thoughts were put together yesterday by Kristen, and attempted to get submitted, and I guess it was rather late. But I did get a copy and was asked uh, this afternoon if I was going to be able to attend, and I guess I'm going to probably end up reading you know, this if You're possible. sitting there, we're listening. All right, so I got more than three minutes to get through this. Please read your letter. <laughs> okay, it says, um, the Forum of Historic Commission does not support the allowance of a 12-story building. 150 foot tall mixed use building to be located at 1148 De Duval Street and 201 Remington Avenue. We feel that doing so would be detrimental to the integrity of our city for a number of reasons. Our first concern is that the height of the project far exceeds those that are suggested by the Forever Waterfront Urban Renewal Plan. The results of visual uh, preference surveyed in the URP, Urban Renewal Plan, are favored images of higher density, three to five stories, residential de development over images of low density and very high density developments. The scale of preferred office developments 
parallel that of the preferred multifamily residential developments, and attendees favored building around four stories higher uh, to those that were shorter or taller. Without any plans to see the proposed buildings, there is the possibility that visually the building will not conform to the proposed building architectural guidelines within the waterfront district section 4.3 of the URP and states the following, all development projects within the urban renewal area that are subject to the city's processes for the site plan review or a special permit are required to follow the guidelines. The planning board will use these guidelines as criteria within their approved process. New buildings in a historic district should relate harmoniously to their neighborhood context by establishing relationships of use scale, dimensions, design patterns, and materials that are compatible with the historic design character of adjacent buildings. The renovations of ad adaptive reuse of existing buildings is preferred to demolition and replacement with new construction especially when the existing buildings are made of durable, good quality materials. And there's also the building replacement, massive scale and proportions should be compatible with the complementary to the alignment and patterns of neighborhood buildings. The property uh, owner is planning demolition of existing structures and a 12-story building certainly is not complementary to the building's currently located in that area. Commonwealth Landing, being a neighbor to this property, is a historic structure that will be dwarfed by a 12-story neighboring building. It is impossible to overestimate the historic significance of our waterfront. Fall River is very fortunate to have a waterfront, and this is a treasured asset that should be leveraged for the good of the community. The city of Fall River has an obligation to its citizens to first put in place ordinances and guidelines to ensure our waterfront historic vistas are preserved and to make sure that these guidelines are followed. The City of Fall River Master Plan, published in 2009, establishes a 15-point vision for the city for the year 2030. This urban renewal plan advances several components of this vision. One, have actively preserved all that is good about the city, including its waterfront, historic buildings, churches, unique parks, natural resources, ethnic diversity, arts, and cultural events. B, an active site for tourism based on its historic and cultural resources, its waterfront, and its ethnic diversity. Another data point is have many attractive mill buildings and other historic structures that have been re rehabilitated to provide for retail, artists, uh, live workspace, tourism, and <coughs> residential uses. The third button is development of waterfront housing without preventing appropriate water-based economic development or public access and use. In 2012, the American Planning Association named the Lower Highlands and Historic Downtown to its list of great places in America. Neighborhoods, both with the, this waterfront urban renewal plan and the downtown urban renewal plan being developed concurrently, includes portions of this neighborhood enticing connections, in, I'm sorry, enhancing connections between the Lower Highlands and both the waterfront and the department will add significantly to its attractions as a great residential neighborhood. Part of what enhances the Lower Highlands historic neighborhood is the views from the neighborhood on the hill down to the waterfront. Putting up numerous large story buildings will certainly block the views that these properties now enjoy and have enjoyed since these neighborhoods were developed. The views of the Taunton River and Mountain Hole Bay belong to all four River residents not just a few who live in the high-rises on the waterfront. These historic views have been seen by generations, and any significant changes should not be made without a thoughtful and insightful plan as to not have a mega impact in the future. 
Social media is four of the sites show citizens posting pictures of water views from their homes, many of which are three tenement apartments, from all along the waterfront and traveling uphill. This instills pride and positivity in the city. The FRRA recognizes, that's the Forever Development Authority, recognizes the fact that the plan does not have a working and review group established and that since 2018, there is a new mix of waterfront activities that impacts the integrity or the accuracy of the plan's underlying assumptions. Three examples of significant changes on the waterfront since 2018 are one, the four of the De development authority voting to hire a new engineering firm to oversee the development of the city pier. B, approved by the governing board of the Massachusetts Cultural Council of the proposed four of a cultural district. This district encompasses a large portion of the waterfront urban renewal plan. This state designation will stimulate new arts and cultural activities and attract businesses to Fall River. C, the impact that the Vietnam Memorial Wall at Bicentennial Park will have a tourism and or will, will aid on tourism and traffic. The Vietnam Wall will be a mainstay and a large tourism draw and future development in this area needs to be considered very cautiously. The Forever Historic Commission asks that we please take all of these things into consideration and that you not deny a variance for this property. We also ask that these concerns be considered in future deliberations for properties to be built in the waterfront urban renewal area. Thank you for your time and consideration. And this was written by our chairwoman, uh, Kristen Oliveira. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I'd just like to add we're pro-business. We're not anti-business. We just would like to be able to review some of these ahead of time so that we wouldn't be in opposition. Okay? Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman? What? Yes. Can we respond? We want me to respond one at a time. Go ahead. If I could, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to respond. <clears throat> We're going to work backwards a little bit from the letter because of some of the stuff's fresh in my mind. This petition has been sitting at the Zoning Board of Appeals since March. So there's been plenty of time to review this project, contact proponents of the development, and have a discussion based upon that. Up next from that, this is not a zoning variance. We are not asking for a variance. So the, the closing line in your letter is that you're asking for the variance to be denied. This is not a variance request. This is a narrow scope special permit request in accordance with the zoning bylaw. Although all the items in that letter may be wonderful and urban plans and everything else, that urban plan falls short of creating the new zoning requirements like it was supposed to do, a number of different provisions. It has not been enacted. It is not a document that this Zoning Board of Appeals has as a mechanism to determine whether or not our petition has merit or not. So although I may agree with many of the items in that, and I've read the, the, the Urban Renewal Plan, and it's a wonderful document, and a lot of time and effort went into it, but just like everything else, it falls short of the finish line like everything else has over time. And as Ken stated, this is a number of years have gone into the development of this waterfront and hoping and pushing and pushing. This WTOD district was only created a few years ago as a mechanism for this to happen. That's what you have to look at. Not an urban renewal plan, not a letter that doesn't address anything with regards to the special permit that we're requesting. So I asked the board to look at the proposal that was submitted and maintain focus on the very simplistic relief that we're seeking via special permit, which is just the height of the building. That's all. Thank you. The, um, let, let's see, that was from Historical Commission, which just read in. There was a letter that I think that was, I'll do them backwards. The most recent, the oldest letter that we got was from Save Our Neighborhoods, dated June 20th, 2020. Um, it's signed by, well, it's not signed. Do we have a signed copy of the letter? It should be, the email should be attached. I attached my comments, are, okay. So yeah. we have an email that electronically makes it a signed letter. So it's addressed 
June 20th, 2020, David Asset, Chairman, Zoning Board of Appeals, regarding special permit request for 1148 Duval Street, LLC, lot S22, 6 and 2. I think, Dan, you've seen this already. That one I have, yes. Save Our Neighborhoods. Yes. Dear Chairman Assad, on behalf of the members of Save Our Neighborhood, I would like to comment on the request for a special permit for the construction of a 12-story, 150-foot-tall mixed-use building, which would contain 200 apartment units and commercial space in the WTOD district on Duval Street and Fall River. A building of this size would result in the possible, lo possible loss of the view of the Tartan River to residents to the east of this building, whose homes on the hill above the site would be affected by the new building. When the rezoning was being considered for the waterfront WTO district, Save Our Neighborhood noted that the allowance of tall buildings in the district would possibly prevent uphill residents from viewing the Taunton River at Mount Hope Bay. A view of the river and the bay is one of the hallmarks of the city of Fall River, and it shouldn't be reserved for owners of apartments in new high rises on the waterfront. However, the Planning Board and the City Council advised our organization that the Zoning Board of Appeals would take that issue under consideration when making a decision to allow a special permit. Therefore, in deciding to grant this permit, we wish to request that the Zoning Board of Appeals continue the hearing and ask the developer to provide an engineer's assessment of how the new building might prevent or not prevent the continued views of homeowners on the hill above the new building. Perhaps this might be accomplished by selecting several sites along the hillside where the views might be blocked. That would allow the ZBA to determine how the new building might affect the uphill homeowners. Given the amount of time that will be given to each petitioner during this hearing, 15 minutes during a virtual meeting, and the nature of the issue for homeowners, it seems appropriate to allow additional time during a subsequent session to allow more opportunity for additional discussion of the special permit Thank you for this opportunity to comment on the special permit. Sincerely, Alfred Lima. Is there anything you'd like to respond to just, there? Just, just quickly, as an engineer, we have looked at those items, and as I said in our presentation, we were very cognizant of creating these corridors where views would be preserved. Again, if we built a six-story building and we brought it up to the top of the Wall Street, by right, no special permits, we're going to be blocking more views than this building will. This is a very narrow, deep building just for that reason, so that we can create those views. And this is not a waterfront property, so we're not cutting off anyone's access to the water. We're bordered by Remington Street. Access to the water directly in front of our site off of Remington Street will not change. It's, it's primarily the electric company who is, who is our abutter directly across the street. Um, so whatever access, currently exists from Remington to the Taunton River will be preserved. So, so that's not an issue. Um, again, with regards to views, there are an infinite number of views that everyone in this city has to the Taunton River. It is impossible, impossible to take on the charge of determining who will be affected and how they will be affected. The applicant has the right to utilize their land. The zoning provision allows for us to come before you and propose what we're proposing. I think you can see that we've gone beyond, trust me, it's cheaper to build a six-story building that's wide and square compared to a high-rise style <clears throat> building, which is 12 stories. But we're taking all of those things into account. We didn't just throw out a plan that's the cheapest building to build and get us our 200 units. That's not what we did. It was very carefully crafted with the right parking, the corridors and maintaining the views the best that we could. That's all. Okay. The next, before I go on, is there any questions or comments from the board before I go on to the last letter, the Preservation Society? So we have a letter dated June 22nd, 2020 from the Preservation Society of Fall River. Dear members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, with recent news of potential new development along Fall River's waterfront, the Preservation Society of Fall River is concerned about the potentially detrimental effect it could have on the historic vistas Fall River is known for and the overall quality of development in the area. Although the development of one or two high-rise buildings alone might do little to diminish the value of our cityscape, Fall River officials and residents should be cautious of the precedent it might set without ordinances in place to protect the best interests of the city. 
Specifically, the Preservation Society would like to call to attention the lack of ordinances regulating the height of new construction along the Taunton River, especially with the extra real estate created by Route 79 project. Failure to put protections in place could literally wall off access and visibility of our waterfront for a majority of Fall River, possibly destroying one of the city's greatest features that residents have enjoyed since its founding. Uh, sincerely, the Preservation Society of Fall River, Inc., Jim Sewell, President of the Board of Directors. And those are the only three two letters and one that uh, was just read in by the representative of um, the Historical Commission. So, is there anything else you'd like to add? Unless any of the board members have specific no. questions, I, I have nothing else to add. Right. I'm going to ask the Director of Planning for his comments on this particular project. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A um, couple of points. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to put on my architect hat for a second. I, I got the sense from some of the um, objections that there was a, a feeling that a, that a new building would could not be consistent with, say, Commonwealth Landing and could not contribute to the neighborhood. And, and I, don't, I don't agree with that. I think that there are a lot of examples in uh, cities throughout the country where uh, even brand new structures, properly designed and properly implemented uh, uh, program-wise, uh, can get along get along very well with their older neighbors, the older buildings in the neighborhood. So uh, it, it doesn't bother me that this is a new building being built on the waterfront. Um, just talking about the guidelines in the urban renewal plan, I, when I first read that section, it looked to me as though the, here was a document adopted by the city council, approved by the state, um, and the language of the, the section that um, we've both read uh, seems to suggest that these are now in effect. And we talked this through uh, this afternoon, the chairman and I and some other folks, and I think uh, ultimately um, the, the issue is, I think as, as Dan mentioned, uh, that section as insofar as it would uh, require the zoning board to consider those guidelines has not been implemented. I think that the, uh, uh, the redevelopment authority has got to step forward and perhaps, perhaps with the uh, cooperation of the planning department put together uh, the um, uh, zoning changes that need to be done to implement that plan, the waterfront and the downtown urban renewal plan, but as Dan says, it has not been done. Uh, particularly with respect to the guidelines that would impact on the special permit process. Um, so that's, that's a project that has to happen. Um, the next thing is I, I think that uh, the site plan uh, that's been put together, you know, I, I coordinate the site plan review committee, and I've got to say uh, I like what I see so far. I think you've done some serious thinking about, you know, locating the new building to the west so that you preserve the view of, of uh, Commonwealth Landing when you're coming down to Vall. Uh, some landscaping features that are very important. Um, I, I think that uh, from the planning department, we're only one of the departments that participates in site plan review, but from the planning department's perspective, uh, uh, I don't see too much to complain about and, and uh, happy to see that. Um, the, um, the other thing um, that I would say um, is that, um, by the way, on those guidelines, uh, they may influence what the Site Plan Review Committee thinks about uh, in, in reviewing the project generally, but I don't see anything offhand in those guidelines that would adversely impact on, on your proposal. Um, and then finally, I think there's just a structural issue in the city. Um, You've made the remark that the plan has been sitting there since March, and, and they're saying, gee, we'd like to have a chance to look at these things in advance. Um, that happens a lot uh, in the city. There's, there doesn't seem to be an institutional structure in place where the left hand can know in advance what the right is thinking about doing, and that's bad. You run into situations where the historic commission say, gee, we really would rather you go in this direction, and redevelopment is saying, well, no, this is what we're thinking, and and zoning is saying, well, here's what we've got to do. And, and that's got to be resolved, I think, in one way or another. I just think back to uh, many, many decades ago studying how the uh, Department of Transportation and, and uh, uh, related agencies um, 
handle uh, that sort of issue. And I think there was a, Ken might, might even remember this, uh, an A95 review process in which uh, uh, various agencies were required to notify each other of pending plans and uh, to help coordinate the things in the transportation sphere. And maybe we need something like that in an internal uh, City of Fall River process. But it's, it's very clear that the, the left hand does not always know what the right's doing, and that's, that's a problem. So um, aside from that, thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, you've got some points that you can work on as the director of planning to try to coordinate and make those all work. One of many points. I know. <laughs> uh, so, members of the, is there anyone else that would like to be heard before we go forward? I just, one yeah, thing. Who's uh, that? Who's I? John Frank? John Frank. John Frank. Um, any, uh, before it goes to site plan, they have to have a final architectural drawing, correct? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. yes. Right. Yes. Uh, okay. Hey. We're in the infancy. All they're looking for yeah. is we're very yeah. limited scope as far that's, as just allowing. That's correct. Open. That's it. With, okay. With with the limit, not more. If we grant, not more than 150 feet, not right. more than 12 stories, no, uh, and other than that, that's the only. It's just the special permit grant. That's it. And if we say we don't like it at all, we deny it, and that's it. We got an education about how to develop a 12-story narrow building east to west. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I move that we Who's grant that? approval for the special permit. Okay. Jim Calkins makes the motion to grant the special permit not to exceed 12 stories or 150 feet, the only relief being asked for by the petitioner. I would also add that this site plan review and this development will probably take more than a year. So is your grant for two years? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So that's Jim, second by Dan Dupair. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Jim Calkins? Aye. Uh, John Frank? Yes. Aye. Carol Amara said? Yes. Dan Dupair? Yes. Chairman Assad? Yes. That special permit is granted for two years. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Is it 8 o'clock yet? Probably. It is well past. <laughs> well, well past. Does anybody need a break? We'll just keep oh, wait, I don't think is that does anyone need a break? Uh, we're almost done. I, think we, I don't know. Here you go. Who's this one? Oh, maybe one of those was Dan. Did I have your um, letter? one of each, which That's is what right. I need. You've got one of each? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I actually got two of each. If you want an extra historical commission, I got it. I, I really don't, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to do uh, agenda item number eight. Michael, well, Dan, do you need a break? No. Michael and Mary Olaski, 3671 North Main Street, lot X535, special permit request pursuant to 86424 to change an existing non conforming use of property by converting the commercial greenhouse nursery into a hair salon spa. Uh, lot size 17,380 plus or minus square feet. This is a repetitive petition, um, and as such, it requires the board to take action uh, before we can actually decide the case under 40A, Section 16. Um, so under 40A, Section 16, so there's no mistake about what we're doing, it says, 40A, Section 16, repetitive petitions, no appeal, application, or petition which has been unfavorably and finally acted upon by the special permit granting or permit granting authority shall be acted favorably upon within two years after the date of final unfavorable action, unless said special permit granting authority or permit granting authority finds by a unanimous vote of a board of three members or by a vote of four members of a board of five members or two thirds vote of a board of more than five members specific and material changes in the conditions upon which the previous unfavorable action was based and describes such changes in the record of its proceedings and unless all but one of the members of the planning board consents thereto and after notice is given to the parties in interest of the time and place of the proceedings when the question of such consent will be considered. 
So of that requirement, my understanding is the planning board has already considered this particular petition and I believe has voted unanimously, Brittany, to allow it to come before the zoning board for a rehearing. Yes. So now we uh, have to decide whether or not there has been a specific and material change from what was brought before the board and was denied, um, I think it was November 21st of 2019, where it was the matter of Frederick Hume and Faith Latessa, care of Attorney John Mitchell, a special permit request to convert the flower garden center retail nursery into dispatching transportation business with related uses of a non-public auto repair and auto sales for an on-site business purpose waiving requirements in the S district. So that was what we had back in November, which was for the auto repair and the uh, dispatching um, and related uses. And now we have the petition before the board for a hair, is it hair salon and spa. So if we think that the difference between the auto repair and the hair salon and spa is a specific and material change in the conditions upon which the previous unfavorable action was based, then we can have that motion to say that what's being presented is in fact um, a specific and material change and then we can go on to the merits of it. If we don't think it's specific and material, then the case is over and everyone goes home on that. Mr. Chairman, yes. I find that there is a substantial difference between the petition that had been previously submitted. The hours of operation were totally different. The traffic flow patterns were totally different. The objections to the original petition do not apply to this petition. And I move that we find that it is substantially different. Okay. So we have a motion by Jim Calkins that there is specific and material changes and he articulated what those changes were. Do I have a second on that motion? I'll second. Second by Dan Dupier. Any discussion on that motion? All those in favor? Jim Calkins? Yes. John Frank? Yes. Dan Dupier? Yes. Vice Chair Carol Morissette? Yes. Chairman Assad? Yes. Okay. So you've Thank satisfied 40A you. Section 16 requirement. Let's move on to the merits. Again, for the record, Dan Aguiar of SciTech Engineering here this evening on behalf of the landowner, Michael Orlowski, with regards to the real estate at 3671 North Main Street. Um, you will see in our petition uh, filed under the specific section that allows for the change in use of a non-conforming use where the board finds that it is not significantly more detrimental than the existing uh, non-conforming use. The site has been utilized for many, many years, and I'm sure Mr. Olowski can give you the exact date uh, of when the uh, retail and wholesale nursery and greenhouse business um, had been operating at this location. Uh, the, the type of use that is currently there now, what you see is a very a large increase in vehicular traffic and pedestrian traffic and just general customers um, during specific times. Saturdays, crazy when people are all home. Sundays uh, during the week as well. And where this is a was a retail and excuse me still is a retail and wholesale facility during the week, we have a lot of commercial uh, traffic, landscapers and everything else coming to pick up their wares for the day, whatever that may be. And then on weekends it was more of a retail facility, but very intense at certain times. Um, sometimes erratic hours, you could go hours with no one there, and then you could have hours where you've got 50 people there, different holidays and everything else. So we have a, a specific type of use um, where traffic, noise, dust, just in general, the facility itself is far more intense than that of what we're proposing now, which would be a spa and um, beauty salon. You see on the plan that we presented to you now, um, we have provided a certain number of parking spaces to exceed that requirement um, required by the zoning bylaw, so we, we've met that requirement as well. Uh, this will be a facility that has a set amount of business hours, um, far less intense traffic, far less intense noise, far less intense dust and noxious uh, fumes that, that may come from a facility that has fertilizers, plants, 
any types of organic materials. And again, this sits in the middle of an S district, which is surrounded by single family homes. Um, so the proposed use in my mind is clearly uh, less detrimental than that of the existing nursery uh, and greenhouse. If you have any specific questions regarding um, hours of operations and things of that nature, I can see that Kim Madiris, who is the potential uh, purchaser of this parcel of land, I think she can relate to you the hours of operation and things of that nature that you may want to write into the decision. That's exactly what we want to hear. Yes, yep. please. Is it Ms. Madiris? Yes. All right, so can you tell us about your hours of operation? How much? It will be open. I'm sorry? No, please. Um, so during the week, we're closed on Sundays, but we'd be operating from 9 to 7, sometimes 9 to 8, the latest. 9 to 8, Monday through Saturday? Correct. Closed on Sundays? Yes. How many, how many people will you be having? How many employees? Well, I do have seven, but they rotate on different days. They have different shifts. They have certain days off. So it's not seven all the time in the same location, but seven employees. So on a, any given day, how many employees do you think you'd have there? Um, some, the most like five, six, maybe. All right, so you may go as many as seven. Yes. Okay. Um, and they'll be able to park on site. So your employees will park on site. People, your client base will be coming by appointment only. There's no walk-ins? Yes, uh, we are pretty much all appointment only. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if you see on the site plan, um, we've been able to provide uh, 20 parking spaces. No, I see that. I just want it with seven and I'm figuring sure. two each, so that's gets me to 14, 15. We're good. Um, okay. Uh, any signage? There, there will be signage that um, there is some current signage that's on the property now. Um, once we figure out what we're doing, I mean, we could be limited to like a four by eight sign uh, that we go through a site plan review and we can show the location of that sign as well. Because so in maybe the S some, district, you don't signage. Right. So, so I'm we, asking the question. So yes, we would have we would have a, a building facade sign and then a four by eight pylon style or monument style sign near the entrance. Illuminated, non-illuminated? Non-illuminated. Four by eight? Four by eight. That would be the pylon. And let's say... Is there a pylon there now? I, no? I don't know exactly what's there now. Mr. Olowski, do you know what... Is there any signage on this property now? It is there. Pylon. All right, so you... Okay. All right, so, so they'll, use the, to, they'll use the... Limited to the existing signage and pylon sign. Um, let me see if the board has any questions. Uh, is there any board member? Any, yes, John Frank. Uh, no, no changes to the existing structure then. Uh, just on the interior. So no, on, on the exterior, no. There would be no, maybe some siding or a roof if, if need be. I mean, once the property is no, purchased. No changes. No, no structural, structural changes. No structural yeah. physical size changes to the building. No. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and it will be a, if we grant it will be a special permit. With another change of use, it wouldn't be a variance that would go with the land. If there's going to be a change, they need to come back here come back. to get permission. All right. Uh, Jim Calkins, any questions? No, sir. Carolyn? No. Dan? No. Is there, Director, any no, thank you. Is there anyone here in favor of this petition? Is there anyone here? Oh, oh, that was Joe. Anyone? <laughs> opposed to this petition okay so this is a special permit um, do we need to chairman I move approval of the special permit for a period of uh, so we have a transfer of land that, that it is not substantially more detrimental to the neighbor could that it would be more beneficial in fact okay very good right in accordance with 86 uh, 424 is it a two-year grant that you're proposing yes okay um, the hours of operation being Monday through Saturday, 9 to 8. Did I hear you say that? I Sunday did not closed. Limit them, yeah. And um, the existing uh, pylon sign, 4 by 8, can be used with a uh, building facade sign. That's fine. Yes? Is that everything I heard you say? Yeah, if we need to include that, I would think that that's. Okay. Do I have a second for Jim's uh, motion? 
Second by Dan Dupere. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Jim Calkins? Yes. John Frank? Aye. Yes. Dan Dupere? Yes. Vice Chair Carolyn Morissette? Yes. Chairman Assad, yes. That petition is granted with those conditions. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. Like the smile. Is, is it? It's 815. We're beyond that. Okay, we ready for number nine? Yep. Uh, I think so, time wise. JEI, I don't know. JEI Properties LLC, 2329 Etna Street, lot C234. A special permit request pursuant to section 86423B, uh, proposing to subdivide the parcel into two lots. Lot size one, 1,672 square feet. Lot size two for lot two, 4,107 plus or minus square feet, leaving a residential dwelling uh, existing continuously since 1954 on each parcel in the A2 district. Good evening again for the record, Dan Aguiar of SciTech Engineering, here this evening on behalf of the applicant. Um, similar to a number of the petitions this evening, um, this is a special permit request to subdivide the property, leaving a two-family dwelling on one parcel, a three-family dwelling on the second. Both structures were built uh, approximately in 1922. Um, what we've done is very similar to the others, is to provide access to both homes in a, in a manner that allows them access to a rear bulkhead um, and access coming in off of Etna Street. Now, we have not shown off-street parking on this. Um, when you, if you visited the property, and I don't know if anybody had a chance to, um, we have some very nice lawn areas. These are super well-kept properties, and there's a short retaining wall that runs along the front of the property that would need to be removed in an elevation to traverse to get some off-street parking in there. These two properties have existed on this street with all of the other homes for many years without a parking issue. Uh, so we would request that no off-street parking um, be required uh, so that they can maintain the existing landscape that they currently have on the site and not to have to deal with the elevation difference with that retaining wall along the front. But that wouldn't prevent uh, the three family number 29 if they wanted to to put a driveway. If they wanted to, if they wanted to, they could to do take it, but the you just, expense. Not, you're asking not to impose a As condition. part of the special permit, that's correct. Um, is there going to be an issue? Uh, with no fences on this one? No, I think uh, similarly as how we've handled in the past, I think on this one, um, I would say, I think what, what we've kind of done on some of these was that, but we don't even want to get that. I was going to say, we've had one where we just said no fences within 10 feet of a building. But I think if we say um, no fences along the newly created line, I don't think that'll be an issue. And utilities uh, I, will I, be separated. No, I'm, I'm looking, the four feet is... Right. If I eat a little bit more, the four feet may not let me walk yeah. by it. Right. Uh. <laughs> so again, if it gets granted, I will speak to the owner, and, and I'm assuming that they may want to grant some type of, again, straddled easement uh, of that four feet to allow okay. access to get around to the building. But no, I'm not opposed to the, um, to the no fences, and utilities, of course, will be separated. I think I, I like think the straddle have. easement because if that's the bulkhead to get in and you've yep. got that elevation sure. over there, that may be an issue. We wouldn't be opposed to that as a yeah. condition. Okay. All right. So uh, separate utilities if it's not already. Uh, members of the board, any questions on this particular petition? No? John? John? No. Is there anyone here in favor of this petition? Is there anyone here opposed to this petition? Can I get a motion to grant with conditions, a motion to deny? What do you want to do? No? Motion. Go ahead, Carol. I make a motion to grant with the conditions you listed. Okay, motion to grant with the conditions that we listed. Two-year grant, no um, the easement, um, cross easements to, to be presented before. The, con the property is conveyed, no, uh, no fencing, um, and the uh, affidavit to be recorded within two years, a two-year grant, um, or before one of the properties is sold. Okay. Yeah. Do, do we have a second? Thank you, Carolyn. Do we have a second on the motion? Second. That was John Frank. Second. All those in favor? Jim Calkins? Yes. John Frank? Dan Dupere? Yes. yes. Carolyn? Yes. 
Yes. Chairman aside, yes, that petition is granted. Two-year grant. Good luck. Thank you very much. And we're all caught up. Oh, no, we have one more to catch up. The zoning meetings, I mean. Oh, oh yeah, I don't Tuesday. Know. Do we have, we don't have the minutes, right? We have. We have no minutes at no this minutes meeting. No minutes yet, no. Okay. There's no other, no new business to bring before the board that we can do. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Dan. Second. Who's that? Carolyn says yes. All those in favor? The floor of the Zoning Board of Appeals for the City of Fall River, June 25th, 2020, is hereby closed. Thank you all. Thank you.